So welcome back. Uh, I'm John Blythe. I'm the assistant curator for the North Carolina collection here at Wilson Library. Um, I hope your bellies are full, but not so full as to start to nod off that kind of stuff. Um, I'll, I'm honored and, and pleased that my colleagues uh, have asked me to help in this small way with this conference. Um, one of my main duties with the North Carolina collection is to acquire published materials about the document North Carolina and, and North Carolinians. Um, and conferences like this one uh, provide me uh, a preview of rich stories that I hope will end up in books, journals, audio or film documentaries, multimedia projects uh, that I can add to our collection. And I suspect that most of you also are hoping that your work will end up in books, documentaries, that kind of stuff. Um, I'm also happy to be here because uh, it gives me a chance to see uh, see you again. Um, in addition to uh, the main, our, my main responsibilities here at Wilson, most of us also do a, a shift in our uh, second floor research room. So during your fellowships here, I was the person who checked in or out your materials, probably didn't say much to you other than you want this on hold for tomorrow, that kind of stuff. but. You know, um, I will say I'm also a former reporter, um, so I'm curious, and my kids might even say a little nosy. So when I was handing you the Southerners for Economic Justice papers or the NC Farm News, um, I was sort of thinking, well, you know, what are they going to do with this? What what are they working on? And I didn't want to take you away from your research, so I didn't try to engage you in a long conversation. Well, now I know, and... and um, I'll say in my best teacher's voice, uh, good job, you spent your time well, that kind of stuff. Um, the title of this panel is Navigating Systems Not Built for You. And while I had nothing to do uh, with coming up with the name, I, I get why my colleagues chose it. Um, we're about to hear stories of uh, burglars and virtual slaves, um, two very different types of, of people, yet, similar in that they are all outsiders or seemingly living outside the norm. And that's all I'm going to say. Uh, our discussant, um, Hillary Green, will, will talk about more. She's the James B. Duke Professor of, of African Africana Studies at Davidson College, where she explores the intersections of race, class, and gender in the pre-1920 African and pre-1920 African American history. Reconstruction Studies and Civil War Studies, Civil um, yeah, Civil War Memory. Dr. Green is author of Educational Reconstruction, African American Schools in the Urban South, 1865 to 1890, and currently working on a second book that focuses on half, how African Americans remembered and commemorated the American Civil War and its legacy. Uh, in Ju January 2015, uh, she created the Hallowed Grounds Project for exploring the history of race, slavery, and memory at the University of Alabama, where she was then. And uh, she also looked at the post-emancipation developments in Tuscaloosa um, as part of that project. I'll say no more, Hillary Green. Thank you so much for that introduction. And I'm also a proud Tar Heel. Got my PhD here in 2010 history. So <laughs> welcome to be home. So I want to introduce our panelists and um our now I'll talk about this title because I find it fitting that we're talking about navigating systems not um built for you in an archive that was not built for these voices and that history and how that lingers. And I'm excited to see these scholars' works develop further because they are engaged in asking new questions of the archive and those violences and archival silences. And I'll talk more later of that. But I wanna briefly introduce our speakers and I'll do it in order of the program and I have an update for you. The first will be um, Rebecca Acock, who's a six year PhD student at the University of Kansas. She'll be presented on her work. I'll tell you about the burglar man, the sympathetic white burglar in the 20th century US post culture. Um, our second paper, sadly, Irene Newman will not be able to be here today um, due to illness. I, um, so we'll have time for questions and answers, but I will read, um, read her paper and provide 
full comments on hers as well in absentia. So I just won't do it today, but I will send my comments to her so it will be there. And our last um, um, panelist is Catherine, uh, Dr. Catherine uh, Stiefel a recent PhD from the University of Florida. Uh, congratulations on defending and <laughs> getting done. Um, she'll be presented on a group of people called Virtual Slaves in her piece, Hired Out and Self-Hired Virtual Slaves Interaction with the Law in Antebellum, North Carolina. With that being ado, I'm going to go in order with um, Ms. Uh, Rebecca Peacock, followed by Dr. Catherine Stiefel. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, it's wonderful to be back and um, also a special welcome to my parents who get to be here. They, um, I am in from Kansas um, and I never get to show them what I do. So today they get to be here and that's very special. Um, is that better? Thank you. All right. So <clears throat> I'll stop, start with the folk song, The Burglar Man, which I feel like people in this room may be familiar with. Um, the folk song, Burglar Man, tells the story of a burglar caught in the act. The burglar sneaks into a home, but as he searches the bedroom for valuables, a woman enters. The burglar hides under the bed, presumably to wait until she leaves so he can finish the job. As he lies in wait, he witnesses her undress from the day, pulling out her glass eye and taking off her wig. Disgusted by the woman's appearance, the burglar tries to escape the bedroom without her noticing, but he fails. The woman holds a gun to his head in an attempt to seize what is, apparently, her last opportunity to find a husband. She orders him to marry her or get shot. The song ends with the punchline, woman, for the Lord's sake, shoot. Yeah, um, this admittedly, I'll say boring and sexist humor is still a burglary narrative and an old popular one at that. The burglar and burglar man, like so many other burglary narratives first recorded or first written in the turn of the century United States, drew sympathy from audiences in one way or another. Um, though I stole the song's opening phrase, I'll tell you about a burglar man for my own title. Um, it's something of an empty promise because I can confirm almost nothing about the identity of this period's burglar man. Um, I can, however, share some things about burglary. Um, and then I'm gonna share a few examples of fictional depictions of gentlemen or cat burglars um, from the early 20th century, um, almost all of which I was first introduced while on fellowship here. Um, and my analysis of these burglary narratives is instructive in one aspect of the complicated racialization of burglary and anxiety surrounding domesticity, policing, and class during this time. Um, more broadly, I am writing my dissertation on the affective life of burglary in US law and culture um, from around re reconstruction through the early 20th century. Um, while my interest in the home and American culture and affect and history came earlier, my interest in burglary specifically came from reading Seth Koch's book on on capital punishment. Um, I was struck by his reference to Burglary's association with rape and the fact that it remained in many cases a capital crime as late as 1941. I went looking for the book on burglary I assumed existed um, and realized I would have to write it. Burglary seems to be a simple crime. It seems like this a historical universal wrong um, that we should not sneak into each other's houses and steal each other's stuff. And I will go on record to say that I agree. Um, but that's not what burglary is, um, not then and not now. Looking at burglary in law and in culture reveals not only contradictions and inconsistencies in its definition, but an apparent lack of substance. Over the past decade, some legal scholars have questioned why burglary remains a separate crime in our justice system, given its apparent redundancy with other crimes and the flimsy nature of its definition. Though often conflated with other property crimes like breaking and entering, burglary is a distinct crime that has historically been a capital felony because of its association with home trespass and with rape. Um, 
So calling burglary a thin crime, um, legal scholar Helen Anderson proposes that burglary still exists because of a social attachment to the memory of the crime as it was defined by English common law. So here's the origin of burglary in legal code. Um, a burglar is by common law a felon that in the night breaks and enters a mansion or a dwelling house um, of another of intent to kill some reasonable creature or to commit some felony within the same, whether his felonious intent be executed or not. Burglary then has six criminal elements, which until recent history remain defining elements and helped give at least the appearance of a distinct offense, a nighttime entry by means of a break into someone else's dwelling or mansion house with criminal or felonious intent. And I always take the time to dwell on burglary's definition because it is of interest to me, but also because of the clash and colloquial understandings of burglary and the legal reality. The nitty gritties really have life, life or death consequences. So there is no act involved in burglary that is not already forbidden under the definition of other crimes. Um, and what I argue strings burglary along is something different altogether and why I choose to study it in terms of affect. To better understand our attachment to burglary, I consider how burglary remains a crime because of and not in spite of its then qualities. By taking an approach that considers narratives of real and, as I'll share today, fictional burglaries in U.S. culture, I'm able to track the cultural construction of burglary and better understand its resilience. My analysis of burglary in these areas advances my argument that burglary is an affective crime with an investment in perpetuating whiteness that is occulted by its association with American values that are painted as neutral and ahistorical. So the home, domesticity, public safety. Um, paradoxically, such associations are what gives the crime its historical and racial charge. So while concerns about real burglary and a popular interest in crime fiction led to frequent depictions of burglars, ideas about the identity of burglars in the second half of the 19th and early 20th century vary dramatically. Though the turn of the century US saw the rise of the cat burglar and the gentleman burglar in popular literature and on stage and screen, this was not indicative of all characterizations of burglars. These stories commingled with post-war hysteria about, quote, Negro burglars in the press and popular fiction. Mainstream news reports discussing railroad workers criminalized them, would stereotype the Chinese as burglars, but the Irish as drunks. Women were not considered potential burglars because of gendered expectation for women to be keepers of the domestic sphere. When caught as burglars or accomplices in real and fictional cases, women across race and cl class boundaries were often deemed victims coerced by the real burglars to participate or as exceptional lady burglars. Now, my goal is not to determine the real burglar characterization or to unpack statistics, which were overwhelmingly gathered to serve the growing home security industry. Rather, my objective is to look at one way burglaries affective life circulated during this time period in the American public. All right, there is of course a wealth of scholarship on the rise of popular culture and mass media, much of which discusses concerns about urbanization, crime, and the impact of popular culture on the morals and values of the working class. These depictions of overwhelmingly white men as sympathetic burglars though are a cause for particular investigation. To the frustration of political and religious leaders, these burglars were handsome, humorous, intelligent. They drew admiration from audiences. They were skilled or career criminals capable of navigating wealthy homes, outsmarting the police, and cracking modern technology like alarms and safes that began to be aggressively marketed to the public. The gentleman burglar was an expression of traditional masculinity in many ways, but not one that aligned with expectations for American citizenship. His greatest crime was betraying racialized class allegiance and foregoing the proper path, literally and figuratively, to material gain in the modernizing capitalist state. Gentlemen burglars would increasingly be redeemed and rewarded with a wife, job, and children by the end of the story. Some foreign burglar narratives were rewritten for American audiences to ensure the state won in the end. The police caught the criminal and was redeemed with a legitimate career and marriage to a beautiful wife. Here we see the internationally popular and much adapted raffles, gentleman burglar, sometimes gentleman thief, um, or cracksman. Increasingly, and especially for American audiences, Raffles lost his sexually charged relationship with a male sidekick, turned himself in or was captured by the police or detectives, and was saved by love with a glamorous woman. 
though Raffles was upper class and just making a fool out of high society, so not exactly stealing for his dinner, although sometimes stealing for the poor, feeling sorry for the wealthy victims of Raffles' burglaries was not how audiences wanted to direct their sympathies. The class issue at hand was a disrespect for the progressive era elite, while flashing arrows pointed at a growing impoverished population whose work made the lavish conditions of the newly wealthy possible. These new endings then disappointed audiences. One newspaper detailed how boys were heard lamenting after seeing the film Burglars at the Ball. The burglars were caught and clubbed by police. But the boys thought they could have, quote, made their getaway if they had been a little smoother. In reality, audiences were looking for catharsis more than criminal inspiration. But the anxiety of officials and the sympathy of the public is part of the affective history of these exchanges. Garnering fear about moral decline was an easier sell than redirecting the sympathy to the wealthy victims. I open with the folk songs, though, because burglary sits sort of in two worlds. This timeless crime that draws up this quaint image of a safe nuclear home, but also a historically specific, sensationalized fear about crime in burgeoning cities. Compared to the humorous burglar man, the Boston burglar, with older roots in Ireland, is a sobering warning tale of a man led astray. Allusions to the prison and disappointed motherhood make Boston burglar sympathetic because of a tragic loss of potential. But at a time of great economic and social change, maintaining specific ideas about what burglary was and encouraging universal disapproval of, even active fear of, burglary was essential. Studies of property crime cannot treat private property as a neutral factor, which is the struggle I have had with legal historiography especially when reckoning with nationalism during such a dramatic period of U.S. imperial expansion. Furthermore, burglary cannot be divorced from the rural areas or from the South, where the morally vacuous depths of private property interest and its relationship to whiteness as ideology had long been laid bare. Moreover, these were areas where issues of crime, criminalization, and the rise of the modern police and justice systems were high stakes central issues. I wanted also to talk some about children's, um, children's stories. Um, children's burglar stories were similarly sympathetic, but with a morally instructive twist. Um, here are a few illustrations from Barnett's Aditha's Burglar, which was made into a play written by Augustus Thomas, um, among many other renditions. Um, this narrative, the um, angelic Aditha, um, she's illustrated um, with the light shining on her and the a white robe, um, usually up above the adults in the image. Um, she saves the day. She fears, but she sympathizes with a burglar who breaks into her parents' home. She confronts him and helps him with his job, asking only that he not wake up her sick mother. Though the burglar successfully escapes that evening with Aditha's assistance, he is ultimately captured. Her parents take her to visit him. I can't help but find that it's so bizarre. Her parents take her to visit him in jail where he gives her a stolen trinket for her kindness here we <laughs> i know um here here we see some of the original illustrations from from aditha's burglar um, we see the child heroine aditha and then the burglar free and the burglar captured um, of course parodies almost immediately mocked and criticized aditha's burglar in similar stories um, to the left we see the cover of the parody burglar bill um, in O. Oh, Henry's Tommy's Burglar, the child protagonist Tommy turns to a burglar who has broken into his home and asked if he had ever been caught by the police. The burglar replies, I said burglar, not beggar, and later escapes as predicted with the child's assistance. This brief exchange criticizes literary trends and gestures at broader social issues in the turn of the century United States that exasperated many authors. What is ludicrous about burglary narratives like this one, at least by O'Henry's assessment, is that the police would prioritize catching burglars rather than punishing the poor, let alone that a burglar would be inspired to live a moral life of wage labor as the result of a run-in with an angelic child. So um, I'll wrap up shortly. Um, considering these social and economic circumstances in the turn of the century United States, Reasserting the inherent wickedness of burglary was a national priority. Um, burglary, whether committing it or failing to condemn it, uniquely combi combined threats of a declining respect for established, but always tenuous class, race, and gender boundaries. That these hierarchies must be reasserted during times of extreme poverty, expanding capitalism, and industrial change comes at no surprise. 
Furthermore, as the nation grew across and beyond the continent, reasserting the sanctity and safety of the domestic was integral to maintaining a desired national narrative, particularly as so few, including the white working class readers and audiences, had access to any of the spoils. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'll just add my appreciation for the Wilson Library and their staff um, who paid great attention to my research and helped me finish my dissertation and uh, helped me obtain my PhD. Um, I have to say working at the Wilson was a pleasure. Um, today, I will be speaking about virtual slaves and their interaction with the law. While virtual slave may not be familiar, antebellum North Carolinians um, especially, were especially familiar with this category of slave who worked unsupervised for their own benefit, either as self-hired or hired slaves, which was strictly against the law. North Carolina's citizens referred to virtual slaves as um, in, by, by a variety of names. I'd help if I put my glasses on. Um, they were often called quasi-free, semi-emancipated, or virtually free slaves. And these enslaved people were considered a threat to institutional slavery and um, the social controls of the community. For example, in Thomas v. Palmer in 1854, Judge Richmond Pearson held that virtual slaves are the worst of two evils. These slaves are protected by their masters so that, quote, they can control their own time and they become objects of, enemy, of envy and make our slaves discontent. A recognizable example of virtual slaves are Thomas Jefferson's sons and servants, um, Je Robert and James Hemings. As historian Gordon Annette Reed, uh, Annette Gordon Reed notes in her book, The Hemings of Monticello, the Hemings brothers, quote, nominal slavery, end quote, offered them the opportunity to work on their own as valets, traveling companions, um, and even advanced men for Jefferson as he traveled to Washington, <clears throat> Paris, and Philadelphia. As wage earners, Gordon Reed writes, the brothers developed, quote, identities of their own that had nothing to do with Jefferson. These free roaming brothers uh, frustrated Jefferson's plantation bound in slaves and his slaveholding neighbors. However, the majority of virtual slaves were not sons of famous presidents. Virtual slaves are more aptly represented by the far less famous North Carolinians who crafted strategies to frustrate the legal regime that controlled them. The existence of virtual slaves refuted pro-slavery's proponents that enslaved people were incapable of living independently or managing citizenship. Today, I'd like to focus on three cases that illustrate virtual slaves' interactions with the law. I'd like to talk about Joe Hostler in Cumberland County, Peter in Pasquotank County, and George Mo Moore Moses Horton, who um, is from Cumberland County, I mean, from Chatham County, right here in Chapel Hill. I'll begin with Joe in Cumberland County. Joe was a barber by trade and owned his own shop in Fayetteville. He was enslaved by, Jake, uh, by Caleb Nichols, and Joe and, K and Nichols entered into a self-purchase agreement. Joe agreed to purchase his freedom for $1,000. Joe paid Nichols in full. However, before Nichols 
could execute Joe's deed of manumission, he became insolvent and Joe was sold to David Smith to satisfy Nichols' creditors. Joe then negotiated a second self-purchase agreement with Smith. Joe would purchase his freedom for $500 and $96 a year for four years. Once again, Joe paid Smith in full. Smith died before Joe, before he could execute Joe's deed of manumission. So fortunately for Joe, um, Smith, he had, Smith had written a certificate verifying that Joe has satisfied his obligations. Along with Smith's wife, who was Smith's estate administrator, Joe initiated a petition to the General Assembly requesting that he be emancipated. Joe's petition was reinforced by the support of 22 of his neighbors who, quote, cheerfully, unquote, signed a petition assuring the General Assembly that Joe was a moral man who deserved his freedom and full membership in the community. The General Assembly reluctantly granted Joe's freedom, though petitions of this type were generally denied. Um, Joe's persistence and resilience paid off. The assemblymen realized that he deserved justice having paid twice for his freedom. Peter, an enslaved overseer, uh, an enslaved overseer is my next example. North Carolinian uh, James Cathcart Johnson's property spread over seven counties in North Carolina and included four plantations. Johnson found that replacing white overseers with bl enslaved black overseers provided a profitable way to manage his farms. Until the 1860s, black overseers such as Peter managed the Johnson plantations and corresponded regularly with him. From the 1840s to 1862, Peter managed Poplar Plantation and Peter wrote Johnston frequently. In a decidedly conversational tone, Peter advised Johnston on his crops, the health of the workers, the farmhands on the uh, farm, and the plantation's general condition. Now, these letters, um, which are in the Hayes collection here, demonstrated that he made independent decisions, that, that Peter made independent decisions, directed the work and the workers of the farms, workers on the farms. Peter also easily interacted and corresponded with the farm's white purveyors, ship's captains, and crop brokers. The plantation prospered under Peter's management. However, the Civil War sparked a change in the dynamics of Johnston's master-slave relationship with Peter. In, 19, in 1862, Johnston received a bad report on Peter that caused Johnston to remove him and arrange for him to be sent, quote, to the Yankees in Baltimore. Peter's faithful management of popular plantation for 20 years offered him the pretense of freedom and an opportunity to provide for his family. One of Johnson's crop brokers who questioned Peter in Norfolk reported that Johnson had had, had 2,000 in banknotes, gold and silver. The crop broker was surprised, however, at, quote, Peter's high notions and the style of his family. Peter had accomplished his five high notions. He was now free and his family subsequently settled in Columbus, Ohio. Though Johnston and Peter both evaded the longstanding law that prohibited hiring out of enslaved people, each had profited. Johnston's farm was managed successfully for 20 years, and Peter gained his freedom and a financial foundation for his life as a freedman. I'd like to end today with poetry from Virtual Slave 
George Moses Horton, who exquisitely expressed the hope of virtual slaves and freedmen. Horton, known as, quote, the colored bard of North Carolina, was permitted to hire his time, live here on his own in Chapel Hill, and write poetry. Horton's first book of poetry, published in 1829, The Hope of Liberty, reveals his talent for protest poetry as well as folk poems. After the Civil War, Horton reluctantly moved to Philadelphia and continued to write protest poetry about the discrimination he experienced there. In, Forbidden, in his poem, Forbidden to Ride on the Streetcars, he writes, why wilt thou from the right revolt? I wish to ride not far. Why wilt thou fear the mild result, nor bid the humble horses halt, but spurn me from the car? He concludes his poem with, ere long we trust the time will come, we'll ride however far, and all ride home together when freedom will be in full bloom regardless of the car. At the end of the Civil War, virtual slaves, now freedmen, recognized legal challenges, faced, faced recognizable legal challenges to live their birthright as American citizens. However, virtual slaves, such as Peter, Joe, and George, pointed the way for freedmen to achieve their their legal rights. Full birthright citizenship, while elusive, remained the ultimate goal. Thank you. So one of the things I want to do um, before I bring for the Q and A is try to keep my remarks brief, but I still have some thoughts. <laughs> so these were fascinating papers, and one of the things that they both show is they fit the panel title: "Navigating Systems Not Built for You." These papers raise important questions and issues as we can, uh, as we as scholars must contend. First and foremost, what is an archive? How does one deal with the archival erasure and intentional silences? But for researchers, how does one deal with the archival violences embedded in the process of recovering the voices and experiences of individuals who were never intended to be included in the archives that we use? And so both of these papers um, question what is that archive, expand how they look at that to recover certain voices and are creating new questions for complicated general scholarly terms and asking and paving the way for new research and uh, future insights. Hence, I'm very excited for these longer projects. Rebecca Acock really, um, I appreciated her close uh, reading of music in the her initial starting with the song, The Burglar Man and its variations as a fictional example of the affective crime of burglary for advancing how audiences would gain sympathy for the outlaw who had no choice but to commit the crime and how that expanded into questions that temper down the sexualized nature of that song <laughs> and the possibility of rape and other acts of sexual violence that's embedded in the crime. And because the act of Berkeley um, represents a violation of residence, a space that's often gendered as feminine and a woman's domain that has been characterized as their domestic sphere during the reconstruction Jim Crow eras. And the association of rape during this time is therefore not surprising, but also that makes um, these accounts very interested for understanding questions about race, nation, and anxieties. Because at this time, Black men who would be lynched at large numbers, rape, theft, and even flirting with a white woman, as the local um, EGI National Museum of Lynching suggests, could result in their death. So yes, these were thin crimes to borrow from the author, and their behavior afforded um, certain kind of Privileges to some, but for other racialized bodies, it led to misconceptions, inconsistencies, and all of which is at the heart of the song, 
the fictional example she used and the law itself. So where race and whiteness comes into play, it's very clear in the short stories, the films, and even the YA literature at the time. This has a trope here for um, white working class individuals to see the modern day heroic Robin Hood per se. But the racial ambig uh, ambiguity of the song lyrics, and I looked them up, <laughs> there's no clear delineation of race in those song lyrics. So I, it would be great for the author to speak about the coded language of race and class that's in those song lyrics versus the other ones, race is very much clear. The song lyrics, it's not. And it also gets the question about audience and possibly alternate audiences for that song, The Burglar Man or The Old Maid. Is this a song just popular among solely white audiences? And I'm thinking about illiterate, more working class vaudevillian audiences who would, I can see with the body language that would appropriate for this. But can it also be refashioned and remade into a popular song performed at black juke joints when race is not specifically coded? And I'm thinking about how other literature at the time, especially black women's literature, you really have to go out of your way to figure out what the racial um, category of that person is unless they tell you. And these song lyrics don't tell you. So how might a black audience or another racialized body audience also find heroic nature in these songs? So think about race and class different way by the audience there. How does it circulate as well as the fiction circulate? <laughs> and I'm really question about the YA novels and things because those are young white girls and what does that say about girlhood whiteness and their training to be the paragons of race to be protected by um black criminals who are rapists who might go in for a uh, crime deserving a lynching versus the white burglar who's trying to disrupt ca um class so i'm thinking about race and class in different ways and audience in that particular piece and i think that way it'll add to your analysis of the song as itself as racially ambiguous, but also perpetuating the racial anxieties of the coverage and leniency of the crimes that you actually do study. So why is the song different in a way? The second paper I really enjoyed because of the idea of virtual slaves as quasi-free self-emancipated who lived under the loose supervision of an owner or trustee and worked for their own benefit. The example shown in the paper really showed the variety of experiences, but also some very careful and savvy navigation of the racial landscape and the law. And it also raised questions about who else might be included in this definition that um, Dr. Stiefel um, gives us. And I was specifically thinking about a category of free African Americans during this time period who petitioned to become slaves especially those who are doing so to enter the law, become a slave, they pick their owner to maintain familial connections instead of being separated because they have to leave. So where do they fit in? Because oftentimes, and I'm thinking about Pasquotank, Shawan, and Perquimans County where these are happening, also within the Quaker communities, <laughs> they too have loose masters. They're still defining, but they're a different category of virtual slave. And I was wondering if you could expand out some, where might they fit in and how, and I think your ideas there and this bringing this in will actually go into another thing of how this practice and these individuals navigation evolve over time. How does one learn from their interconnectedness of black um, knowledge of what is possible, what, what is it possible? And how the Civil War changes that, where those numbers of that latter category will increase significantly under the Confederate States of America. So here, I think some definition of terms in your paper as you revise the dissertation will be very helpful. And I think you have something here. So it's just refining that. And Wilson, I know, will help you. <laughs> The last, as someone who does um, discussion of universities and colleges studying slavery, I'm glad you brought in Horton because Horton shows how individuals as virtual slaves use and to their advantages, colleges and universities to get money, to get education, to get benefits that they would not have. So it fits that category. And I think one of the things I really cultivated and thought about that 
examples, not just George Hor uh, George Morris's Hor Horton, but I'm gonna flip to the students because these institutions are training future lawyers, judges, and politicians, including Ruffin, who you quote in your paper, but not in your presentation. He went to Princeton. He's a part of these North Carolina cases. Uh, Princeton and his other legal um, educational background, he would have been exposed to virtual slaves in his normal experiences. So I'm thinking about Al Brophy and the university court enslaved for these future judges and lawyers who are shaping jurisprudence, but also the lives of these men and women who are navigating these categories. They are lawbreakers too. So who is a lawbreaker when you include colleges and universities? Horton's doing a different type of breaking the law, but he is has a whole community who's complicit in his law breaking. <laughs> so I want the so I'm thinking about how might that Horton, what he's doing, shows him not as the exception, but as a very common occurrence on these institutions of higher ed. So I'm going to put Horton in his context. In particular, those who work with the professors in the labs, because um, University of Alabama, Davidson, slave people are in the classroom. They, they are the lab assistants. Horton writes poetry. These people should be on papers. <laughs> so where does, who's allowing him to get this resistance? Who is his community of other enslaved people? And who are his white conspirators who will then be holding above his head the possibility of throwing him in jail and for, sold down south? So for all of these, I want you to, uh, I want to know more about who's being complicit, including the petitioner who's able to secure his neighbors. That says something a little bit more about these virtual slaves, but the complicity of others to allow this practice to happen. So for me, it's just teasing out, why are they complicit? And how are these men savvy actors who can navigate both individual, personal, and the law in meaningful ways? So for me, I think for both uh, papers, thinking about audience, whether it's the white participants who are complicit in allowing these three men and others to become virtual slaves and create meaningful lives, but also for po potential black audiences of a racially ambiguous song and not just the working class illiterate um, men and women who find a new hero in the time of racial and class anxieties. That being said, I'm looking forward to these future projects as they develop and grow. And I am so grateful that I was able to read them. And I'm grateful that you were able to benefit from Wilson Library that cultivated my own work as a student past and present. Thank you. Okay. Hello. All right. So I'll give opportunity because we have time. <laughs> if you want to answer any of the questions I raise about audience or even think aloud some of the possibilities, expansion in your case, Dr. Stiefel, and then for uh, Rebecca, if you want to think about possible the, how the racial ambig uh, ambiguity might lead to other unintended audiences and what might that change there. And then other than that, open up the floor. I can answer some of your question, um, which is very thoughtful. Um, and I appreciate it. This is the beginning of a chapter for me. So it's very helpful to um, be able to think about it in this forum. But um, I've had to learn when studying crime, not just to think about the identity of the criminal, but also the identity of the victims. Um, so first I'll speak to um, the, the woman in the song um, to sort of, I think, answer your question. Um, it goes beyond the scope, my, my time period, um, but overwhelmingly um, this woman is made ugly in really um, rude and ableist ways. Um, and she's, she's coded as white. Um, and I've I'm referencing other people's scholarship and analysis, not my own um, when I say that, but um, it's very interesting. I, something I listened to while I was here 
um, because they were people from the folk life collection sent me some recordings when I was back in Kansas. It was so helpful. Um, some fifties, sixties, seventies renditions. We see this woman become painted as almost a, a welfare queen character. Um, so the, the race of the woman changes some of the, um, I guess more sexist stereotypes, the idea of an old maid, the, um, necessity of of marriage and and finding a husband some of that stays the same but the depiction of the woman changes um, and that is something i've noticed i have not studied um the audiences I've, I've found out most of this through listening to the records um which is really fun um and through the news articles um, mentioning that there's in a music hall from this time period or on, on a stage, some singer or group is doing, um, doing a show and it lists some of the, um, songs that will be performed in burglar man's on it. Um, but as for tracking demographics of audiences, I'm not so sure. Um, but I will say the majority of my dissertation does reckon with racist Negro burglar narratives. Um, but what is really interesting to me about the, the white burglar, this sexualized, you know, super masculine, super athletic burglar man, um, is that it complicates not just the racializing of the crime, um, but also it pushes back the date of crime being sexualized. Um, absolutely. The Negro burglar hysteria is a part of racist sexualization of crime. Um, but I don't think it's, um, a, a clean dichotomy. Um, but thank you for your questions. It's, it's a lot to think about. And the, and I'll add before, uh, um, offering here, I thought about, um, Malcolm X. Yes. Harlem Red. Days. Yes. He fit the gentleman. That's what I was thinking. And when I look at the songs, like what would, what would he listen to? can he it's, convey himself in here so that's where i was going with that question too i was thinking about absolutely that. i um if you're familiar with malcolm x and the autobiography of malcolm x he has and again something that goes beyond my time period um he went to jail for burglary um and has a very interesting commentary on the involvement of white women um I wish I had the quote. I wish I could put the quote on the board um, where he says, was our crime the burglary or was the crime associating with these white women? Um, but thank you. Oh, and Dr. C. Oh. Hello. Uh, how do you turn okay. <laughs> um, thank you for, thank you for your input. Can you all hear me? Okay. Um, and my dissertation dealt with uh, specifically the legal ramifications of virtual slaves. I think that there are so many types, categories of virtual slaves. There's the barbers and, and you're so interesting about how they would know. Well, if you've, in, in antebellum time, men went into the barbershop almost every day to get a slut shave or a, you know, a haircut, whatever. And if you've ever, you know, gone to any place but Great Clips and had a regular place that you get your haircut, you know what kind of gossip goes on in those places. They picked up all kinds. As a matter of fact, one of my examples of that kind of virtual slave is John C. Stanley, who, you know, went on to be a very wealthy black freeman, but who owned a barbershop, who was trained as a barber from a young age. And he got all his information from, you know, not all of it, because he had white surrogates that helped. But, you know, there's a, there was a lot of information in, in like a barbershop. So how they managed the legal culture, where they were, where they were, thank you, <laughs> where they were, even on, even in plantations. I mean, you know, Peter dealt with lots of ship captains, white purveyors. He understood what was required. And, you know, there's lots of types of resistance, accommodations, re resistance, um, you know, forming alliances, that kind of thing are ways that they managed the legal culture and got information as to how to proceed. 
Um, I think another separate project would be so interesting to cover the lab assistants in an institution because you're right, all of these virtual slaves had the threat of being re-enslaved held over their heads. Um, so um, somebody that's working specifically with a, a academic instructor would be vulnerable to that kind of threat. So I think that would be an interesting project for a different time. Yeah. Thank you so much for your input. And that's why they think about Horton. Horton's like a typical, like Horton, we write because he's like David Potter. He leaves records. But you know where they, the means are on things about tip. They're in faculty minutes. Faculty hire. <laughs> so the actor is cool. So I want to know also, Horton wrote poetry, but which professors hired him? <laughs> to, to, yeah. to the right. So that's what I was thinking about even bringing him out some more. Well, yeah, he, his, the way he earned money was to sell poetry to uh, Chapel Hill students. You know, he sold poem, love poems to them for 75 cents or whatever. And that's, he earned money for his keep while he lived here on his own. But the um, protest poetry, you know, I think, we, they think some of it was used by the American Colonization Society, so. All right, can I open up questions to the floor? Mark hands, oh, thank you, thank you, okay. Questions out for the floor. At least I know it's the mic issue. In the back, um, yes, oh, sorry. <laughs> no, you're taking him now. Okay. Yeah. There you go. Here's a lot of Here's a lot of Maybe if I talk very loudly. It's on? Oh. Okay. <laughs> Hi. Um <laughs> thank you so much for these presentations and Dr. Green for your commentary. Um, I was wondering, Dr. Stiefel, you presented three examples of uh, male enslaved uh, individuals who are virtually free. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about the experience of gender and how that uh, may have impacted the, the choices or the types of resistance or the connections that um, virtually free enslaved women uh, navigated. Sure. Sure. Um, one example that uh, is in the dissertation is about a female enslaved who was um, particularly, the enslaver was particularly fond of her and made an arrangement for her to live on his land with her husband for, you know, the better part of a decade before he died intestate without a will and his heirs came after her and her children. So there's that aspect of it. And a lot of times with virtual slaves in the law, the, the, the controversy comes at the death and the, the heirs come after whether there's a will or not, the, the slaves, the enslaved. The other thing I'd refer you to is uh, Stephanie Rogers and her, she talks about virtual slaves, women in boarding houses and, and as wet nurses, and they were, so that's another, uh, I didn't do that in the dissertation because of, of the interaction with the law, because I was focused on the law, but that's a very good example. Um, I have a rather long footnote about hired slaves and whether, you know, the various historiographies on hired slaves and self-hired slaves. And of course, that's an important one because maternal, I mean, you know, household kind of virtual slaves. And I think you touched on, you know, with, um, you know, some of that when they, as far as geographics, but their jobs, you know, lent, lent them to be virtual slaves and they would, you know, make money as wet nurses or as, as boarding house servants. <laughs> 
Okay, is this working? Sounds like it. Yeah, great. Um, thank you all. Uh, that was super interesting. Um, I have a question about burglary. Um, and I'm just curious if you um, know or can talk about more like the process of um, and like who is involved in deciding who what a person is charged with if they break an ent whether it's um, theft, breaking and entering, burglary. Um, and I'm definitely curious about like any sort of contemporary um, connections or uh, legacies of that. But um, I know that is like far from your time frame. But yeah, thank you. Um, no, thank you. That's a great and difficult question. Um, a lot of what I've shared today is all fictional cases where the burglar, he's he's already decided a burglar by the author. Um, but I do deal a lot with um, people called burglar in the press and reports of real cases um, and a lot of the sensational journalism of this time period. Um, I, I will say that those elements that I shared today, I um, share them in part because most of them were solid during my time period of study. Um, so that would all be an assessment, um, the time of day um, determined um, by levels of darkness um, that was still usually in place. Um, during the, the sort of the end of my time period, we start to see a micro geographic change. That's a pretty big deal. Um, that kind of connects my work to the keynote last night. There's a report um, on you know, why are black people and black families moving from the South? It's a big mystery. Um, sorry. Um, and one of the comments made was about burglary. Um, why has um, burglary law expanded in some of these Southern states from being strictly the walls of the house out to the outhouses and the fences? We see this expansion um, and it's because, quote, well, not exact quote, but Negroes tramping about um, on this migration. Um, so we see the law change and expand in that way. Um, it becomes more capacious. Um, so that is dangerous business. Um, it turns what would be trespass into um, a, a capital felony. Um, so definitely a, a difficult um, line to walk. Um, I'll emphasize too that there's an assessment of intent um, that is very interesting. Um, it's not to my understanding, I'm not trained in the law, um, but it's not like an inchoate crime. It's not um, intent to commit burglary isn't really a thing, intent is built in. So who's, that's a question I have to deal with. Who's in, who's assessing that intent? It's not usually who's assessing the intent in the courtroom. It's the victims, um, which has obviously heavy um, bearing on whether someone will get charged with simple theft, um, trespass, or burglary. Um, I think that answered each part of your question, but you also asked about some contemporary um, resonances. So I will say that a lot of these elements have fallen away technically, but because burglary has this, uh, we have this attachment, that's what these, these legal historians are, are saying. Um, and I do my best to interpret them. Um, there's this folk burglary idea that we cling to that even if it's not technically true, um, it still comes to bear, not just in fiction, but in the courtroom. Um, the example that I usually use um, before saying this is beyond my time period, sorry, um, is that um, the McCloskeys um, or the, I forget their names, I apologize, but um, the um, people who, the men who killed Ahmaud Arbery, um, they... Uh, um, they're one of their lawyers used burglaries um, definition to say or to try to say they ended up failing uh, um, that it's not that you ever steal anything. It's the intent that is in um, one of those court records. So um, that's 
that is one salient recent example of how burglary's historical definition can come to bear on current issues. Thank you for your question. All right, I don't see any questions right now, but I do have one for both about the archive. What do you see as some of the challenges you had doing this work and the law in particular? Because you're recovering voices that are not heard typically. So what were your challenges in doing this work? Both, of you. <laughs> And then I think I finally saw a hand over here, so I'll have that and then make sure. As, as far as um, the challenges in the law are to read against the opinions of uh, judges like Ruffin, who said that, um, or I gave the example of Richmond Pearson, who it's, but to read against those, and then I think too, seeing the change in the law, like we didn't talk about William Gadsden, so, and there's all kinds of ambiguity from lawyers as far as, in one opinion, Gadsden says that, uh, you know, free, free Blacks are citizens, but then he said, he said in the same opinion, the punishment for free Blacks should be different because of there being free Blacks. So it's real ambiguous. So you have to read against that. Um, and then I got lucky in the Hayes collection because there's letters, actual letters from the enslaved themselves. So those are few and far between. John Stanley is a good example of how you can, you know, use an outside example to talk about um, everyday experiences of virtual slaves. Thank you. Yeah, that's a, a good question, but I'll start by saying that a lot of the challenges I would have faced in the archive, um, Matt Turi mentioned this um, in his introduction, um, were alleviated by this fellowship. I did a lot of work um, on random scattered stuff that I would not otherwise have had the time to spend with. Um, I wouldn't know that in some obscure note of this handwritten draft of a, a lawyer's um, making this, this case book, um, he made notes about burglary and questions about burglary, and I would have never had time to go through all of that so painstakingly um, if I had come for a weekend. Um, some was a little tricky. <laughs> um, I spent a lot of time... Um, in plantation records. Um, weirdly, I, I did a pre-prospectus um, dissertation fellowship. So this was before I was honed in on burglary. Um, and then things changed dramatically. But um, just the volume, the volume is what's difficult. Um, but again, that was alleviated by the time, the time and, and the guidance. I will say that um, the Race and Slavery Project that, um, you know, Dr. Swearinger and out of UC Green is an excellent source of petitions that give you, you have to read cursive, but they give you um, petitions from white and blacks, petitions about burglary from antebellum slaves running, you know, virtual slaves who come into the other county selling tea and cakes and stealing our, you know, our hogs. And so, uh, but I mean, it was good for me for the law because the actual depositions and testimonies happened to be in these petitions. So that's another source. Okay, uh, this is for Dr. Stifel. Did you use the narrative of Moses Grandy in your work, okay, he he was a um, a virtual slave. Your definition, and for three times bought his freedom, was tricked twice, but then he was a waterman um, on the uh, the um, Dismal Swamp Canal, yeah. and then um, moved north, and then published a narrative of his experience. It was very popular okay. um, years ago when Wilson Library was first starting digitization. Uh, it digitized the narrative, and then we got contacted by a collateral or direct descendant of Grandy who had not known of this. He has since then organized a, a descendant's uh, reunion, uh, has acquired property in Ghana 
and takes uh, tourist groups to go to uh, West Africa. But the, the grand narrative, Bland Simpson, a local uh, professor and musician here, has actually written a little song on Moses Grandy. So. Um, thank you both for very compelling talks. This is another question for you, Dr. Stiefel. Um, you had mentioned in your second example of a virtually enslaved person, um, Peter, that he was sent away for a troubling report. Yes. Um, and I'm assuming since you're talking about the Hayes collection, this may have came from the enslaved population at the Poplar Plantation. Um, can you speak to what that troubling report exactly entailed? Couldn't find the exact report in the in the in the Hayes. Um, there, that collection has wonderful letters up from Johnston to Pettigrew, who was his good friend. And there's a whole lineage. I mean, you might be familiar with this, um, but no, the letter, the letter from Johnston to um, his crop broker just says, you know, and I couldn't find what he had done. It's, I, I mean, you know, it's, it's a an act of resistance on his part, or he may have been, I mean, you know, I, you, you could speculate, but I couldn't find the actual event, just that. And and the letters between them over the over the years would, you know, you, you can see him start to get more, um, a, not more um, independent and, he has a letter where he says, look, one of your relatives is getting the operation of the of the um, plantation out of order. Don't worry, I'll handle it. I mean, you know, in colloquial, don't worry, I'll handle it. And no matter how long you're gone, I'll take care of it. He's getting more and more independent. You can see that in the letters, but I'm sorry, I couldn't find it. I looked. <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll add my thanks. Uh, enjoyed your presentations. I'm curious, uh, uh, Ms. Aycock, um, you didn't talk about it in your presentation, but you've alluded to it. Uh, uh, we, we got the, you know, the gentleman burglar uh, sort of uh, popular stories, um, and gentleman burglar, seemingly a, a white man, but did the you mentioned the newspaper accounts of, of black burglars, but were there actually sort of books written where there's a, a character that's a, a black burglar or uh, many books written like that? Uh, I'm just curious. Um, <clears throat> there are some renditions that change um, the race. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't think about the songs, um, but I know there's a very interesting and it's the record is it's a silent film, Black Sherlock Holmes, it's in pieces, um, but you can see just flashes of it. Um, but um, yeah, there are, to, to, to answer quickly. Um, there were also, um, in, in the Black press, there was a lot of responses saying, absolutely not. <laughs> we, will, we will not be making our own versions of this. We're above this, <laughs> um, to put it in my own words. Um, Partly because of the stereotypes in the newspapers, there wasn't going to be, at least from from those people's point of view, that was not something they wanted to um, jump in on. It's it's kind of a mess. It's very interesting. Hand in the back. Thank you. Um, thank you both for your papers. They were really, really insightful. And I just have a curious curiosity question um, with regards to the music piece of yours about the, you know, you started with the song with burglary. Um, I'm curious whether there's an overlap with murder ballads. <laughs> 
Um, and whether you've seen any of that in your research, especially the fact that murder ballads go way, way back. I'm yes. wondering whether you see the same kind of deep rooted history even back to the UK um, in this tradition of writing about burglars, burglars and the music around it and whether you see an overlap between murder ballads and this kind of new type of folkloric music. Yeah, um, I'll say that I um, have not done a deep dive on murder ballads specifically, but burglar ballads, both that I, I brought up, are older than my time period. Um, I mentioned them because they're first recorded. They get very popular during my time period, but they're definitely older, which I think is very important. Um, Yes, there's this hyster hysteria around urbanization and burglary and around, you know, after the Civil War, um, criminalizing Black men. Um, so it's historically relevant to my time period, but that is not the origin of these songs at all. Um, a lot of them also overlap. Um, think about early, um, you know, on the gallows, someone gives their you know, their final words. Um, and it's usually that warning tale, the ballads. And I feel feel it's similar with the murder ballads. They remind me of those last words, the, um, or at least the ones that are repentant. Um, but thank you. Any additional questions? We still have time to ask me on this paper. But I'm also, if there are none too, because they've been answering a lot of questions as well here. <laughs> I'll ask, I have the mic, so I'll ask. <laughs> I'm curious, uh, um, Dr. Stiefel, um, you alluded to, um, you know, that, that most of this, or many of the arrangements with virtual slaves were illegal. Um, so I'm curious what the different methods uh, were that, that that the enslavers uh, used to get around uh, or how they, you know, why did, they didn't get arrested for, for breaking the law? Well, they had a lot of complicit neighbors. They really did. And um, Stephen Bassett says early on when he talks about, I mean, the law was in place on the books from 1794 until the Civil War, and it started to get more and more stringent. And you see petitions from whites about this, and you know, and then especially after um, the you know Nat Turner, the law gets stiffer and stiffer. Um, but you know, like this one example I have of where this woman was on this her enslavers' land with her husband and her children. The neighbors ignored it for seven years. It wasn't till the heirs backed in at the end of the, and it all, it, it happens. I mean, the cases, a lot of, I had like almost close to a hundred Supreme Court cases. And it, it happens a lot with the heirs. When the heirs step in, then the whole thing blows up. You know, their ability to keep things on the down low, you know, I mean, Stan, I'll use a really famous example. J.C. Stanley lived as a virtual slave until they, um, you know, until the the his white until the uh, Alexander's freed him when he was twenty, you know, twenty one, or a little later um, in New Bern, right in the middle of the city. Everybody knew. So, um, you know, when they wanted to, if there enact the you know go after the law in the case they brought suit or made it known but so there i mean that's the best explanation i can give you it was strictly illegal you know so does that answer your question thanks for that question I, I have a question, just, just to make it clear. When we're characterizing what the slaveholders were doing as illegal, what were the elements that constituted their sort of dereliction? So what, what were they not doing that would have been expected of them by statute? Does, does that make sense? Sure. Sorry. 
not used to this mic. Um, sure, the, the main thing was that they were, uh, and as I gave in the definition, they were loosely supervised. So that meant, and, and the statute says, they can't, they, slaves cannot go about as if they are free. So that's the definition. And then hiring their own time was strictly illegal. Nobody paid it. I mean, very few pay attention to that because when the agriculture changed and, um, you know, from cash crops to more um, agricultural crops, hiring out slaves became a way for slave slavers to enslavers to optimize their population so that when they had downtime they could hire them out you know so you know i don't so those were the things and um you know it got to be like it, it just they didn't pay attention to they let people do that and um, but those were the, those were the elements. You can't go about as free. You can't hire your own time. And the, the premise was that it would create too many uncontrolled slaves. Um, and as, you know, as Pearson said, um, it makes slaves discontent and it causes revolt and causes thieving. And, you know, it was blamed for a whole variety of sins that slaves might commit. Does that, does that answer your question? All right, it looks like we are at 2.15. Can we give a round of applause for our panelists? And we'll be back in here at uh, 2.30 for our uh, fourth and, and final panel. Um, look forward to seeing you then.